Well, good morning, Grace Lutheran Church and School, our members and our visitors. It's good to be with you on the 10th of May. This is the fifth Sunday of Easter and also Mother's Day, second week in May. It comes. We know when it's going to be, not only by our calendar, but when the peonies bloom and they are ready to bust open and or they are blooming in your yard. So gather some of them up for mom before the ants get them. Uh, we're glad you're here, and we're going to use Divine Service Setting 1 today, our first musical selection. Trading my song.
We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The absolution of our Lord. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the intro. It read responsively. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise, praise in the, the assembly, assembly of the godly. God. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from shale, restored me to life of those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Praise in the assembly of the godly. We continue with the Kyrie and the hymn of praise. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, let us sing. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, let us sing. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Defend us, gracious Lord. This is the peace of victory for our God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Worthy 
us pray. O God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And now we continue with our musical selection. The heart of worship. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. today is from the book of Acts, sections from chapter 6 and chapter 7. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, Pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. 
but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in hearts and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out in a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 146, read responsively. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes. In a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob. Whose hope is in the Lord his God. Who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Who keeps faith forever. Who executes justice for the oppressed. Who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. The epistle reading today is from 1 Peter, the second chapter, beginning at the second verse. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to Philip, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is the gospel of the Lord. Good morning, Grace Lutheran Church and School. It's so good to be able to come to you again. Today, we are going to talk about one of my other favorite things. A few weeks ago, we talked about going for walks, but I also like to go on trips. I like to travel. I haven't gotten to do a huge amount of traveling, but a good chunk of my traveling are road trips. Ever since I was young, we have driven as a family or then as I got older on my own to different places. I've done trips from Omaha, Nebraska, all the way to Austin, Texas. I drove here when I moved here and got to stop and see things along the way. I've done quite a few road trips besides that. And there are a few things that you need when you go on these trips. And I've brought some of them with me. So this is one that I've had a while, and I know it's kind of old school, but I still like to have it just in case. It's a book of different maps. It was given to me uh, when I actually from the place where I get my car insurance. Um, and they gave it to me like right when I first got car insurance, which was a while ago. Um, and so you can see that it's kind of well used. It sits in my car all the time. But then what I use most of the time is my phone because it has a really neat app that has, and lots of people have different apps, but it has a map on it. And you can just put your address in there. I'm sure most of you know that. And the great thing about 
the phone is that it has lots of different things. Maps are great and they tell you where things are, but new roads get added and different things change. And so they have to redo these maps. This is, mine is most likely outdated, though it has the major roads that you need. Um, but my phone can tell me the direction. Um, I'm not north, south, east, west. I, I'm more of a landmark type of girl. Um, but it's nice to know that if someone does say go north, my phone will tell me which way to go. Also, great thing about the app that I use, which I'm sure a lot of the apps have, is that if there's an accident or a backup on the road, it can, if there's another way that will get you there quicker, it'll change your route for you and you can follow that. I know that that has saved me hours sometimes. And it's really nice to be able to have something that tells you which way to go. When we are trying to find our way through the journey of life, we need some help to find the right way to go as well. Each day we face many difficult decisions and sometimes it's hard to know which way to turn. Today on screen, you will see four different directions and each has a different arrow. Let's see how good you are at following which arrow I put up. When you see the arrow, let's say the up arrow, then you will look up if you see one that points to the right then you will look right and if you see the one that points to the left you will look left and so on i think you get the point so we're going to use these arrows throughout while i talk about what we just heard in the gospel so Follow along, and when you see the arrow, do the direction that you are supposed to look. So I want you to imagine how Jesus' disciples felt in our Bible story today. Jesus knew that the day of his crucifixion was coming and that he would soon return to the Father in heaven. He was trying to prepare them for a time when he would no longer be with them. And he said, don't worry. I am going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you can be with me. You know the way to where I am going. Thomas said, no, we don't. We have no idea where you're going. So how can we know the right way? Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Then there was another disciple, Philip, who said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I not been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Jesus wanted his disciples to know he and the Father were one, and that if they were to put their trust in God and in Him, they would join Him one day in heaven. Sometimes life can be very confusing, and we don't know where to turn or what path to take. It seems that every path we take leads to a dead end. Some people go with their feelings and say, this is what I feel is the right thing to do. I feel that this is the right way to go because it feels good. And that's not good because our feelings change day to day. And just because we feel good about something one day doesn't mean it will the next day or that it's even the right thing to do. Some people make choices based on what's popular. I bet you have said to your parents who've told you you can't do something, but everybody else is doing it. But just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean it's the right thing. Besides, tomorrow, everybody could be doing something different. There is one way to know if we are going in the right direction in life, and that is to follow Jesus. As we heard, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We know where we want to go, and we want to go to heaven. 
And now we know that the way to get there is Jesus. If we follow him, we know we are on the right path and headed in the right direction. If we keep our eyes on Jesus and follow his teaching, we will find the path to go, eternal life in heaven with him. We can only come to God through Jesus. And just like our map and our phone, we have some great tools that help us to know the way that Jesus is leading us. And that is the Bible. It's all right in here, the directions that we are to follow. And a great way to hear if there is anything that we need to know is to pray. We are able to communicate with God and he communicates with us through his scripture. Will you pray with me? Dear God, help us each day as we journey through life to follow Jesus and help us keep our eyes on him because we know that he is the way, the only way to you. In his name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us again this Sunday and we really can't wait to see you again. 10,000 reasons.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our message this morning, Can Words Remove the Anxiety and the Fear of Troubled Hearts? It's from that gospel reading in John 14, the first 14 verses. So Jesus opens this farewell address with these words, Let not your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. These are important words for the disciples who live with the threat of Roman soldiers, temple guards, jealous religious leaders, civil narcissists, and a manic crowd that waves palm branches one day and demands crucifixion a few days later. And do not be afraid are important words for us in these scary and uncertain times of coronavirus. Past predictive warnings, worst case warnings have come true. There's a virus and no vaccination. The threat of a flu pandemic is real. It's relentless and deadly. We live with the uncertainties of infection recovery and yea, even our last breath. So for me, the polar ice caps can take a back seat for a while. These are big ticket fears, and the one common to all of us is the fear of death. Matthew 26 says, even Jesus is sorrowful unto death as he prays. Let this cup pass from me. Not as I will, but to your will. The cup of suffering for Jesus is the wrath of God on our sin. And Jesus dreads the impending ordeal of the cross. His agony is so intense that it finds expression in a sweat of great drops of blood. The disciples can do nothing but sleep. The anxiety of our Lord is such an emotional exhaustion for them and trouble for their hearts. So, but even with all of this, consistent with the text that we have this morning, God sends an angel to strengthen Jesus as he prays three times and he accepts the will of the Father unconditionally. And so, in addition to our own mortality, we have all sorts of fears. One is the fear of losing a lifelong spouse. This is a person who always takes care of us, puts up with our weakness and our frailties. Our partner, our source of confidence is gone. We impulsively try to keep everything in place and not move things around, but that doesn't work. Stability and the storm of grief are incompatible. The reality of losing a rib substantiates the fear of loss and it lives as a painful reminder all the good old days. And fear is not limited to adults, is it? Childhood fears are just as serious and 
full of the same angst as adult fears. Fears like being afraid of the dark, the trauma of nightmares. If left unchecked, debilitate and paralyze us for years. One night a mother asked her son to fetch a mop, mop bucket from the barn. He lightly protests, seeking reprieve until morning. Mom, it's pitch black outside. Mom reassures him, using the words of Jesus, don't be afraid, Jesus is with you. So reluctantly, the boy ventures out, trying to tiptoe and stay in the dimming beams of the outdoor lights. When he arrives at the barn, he cracks the door open and he says in his loudest voice, Jesus, if you're in there, can you hand me the mop bucket? Is this story about fear or faith? The answer is always yes. We all suffer from fear, and the remedy is always faith. Another damaging fear, fear of failure. The fear that defaults to doing nothing. Avoiding commitments and refusing to take risks makes our comfort zone a prison. Curled up safe behaviors sacrifice reward for vulnerability. And the freedom of throwing caution to the winds never an option. We play it too safe we accept a life of dreams that never come true. Another fear we all share is one of rejection and a close cousin criticism. These people bend over backwards to the expectation of others. Instead of bearing warts and all, they live a hidden life that masks thoughts and feelings out of fear of what others might think. In the worst case, these poor souls are the product of abuse at an early age that continues as a feast of the bully and the mean-spirited. Fears of rejection incubate at an early age, and we all share them to some degree. Now, the fear of many roots is insecurity. And it often causes an overzealous need for approval. Even the healthiest appearances can hide the fear of insecurity. Many strive to keep their home and their gardens tastefully appointed for better homes and gardens. But if we take a closer look, it often exposes the lack of empty space and too much stuff. The television's always on. Ears are on alert all the time for the next important call, text, email, or post. Silence and time to pray and meditate are not allowed. And these habits don't even preclude the fear of insecurity. They just boost the constant search for self-esteem. So constant digital connection and an elite lifestyle of acquisitions, if left unchecked, distort and rob us of the real priorities of life. Little dated, Doris Day, I know you know the name, and she sang, que sera, sera, what will be, will be. She glowed and she smiled when she sang those words. She must have been a risk taker, finding the anticipation of an unknown future exhilarating. But the risk adverse don't buy her recording. They're scared to death of a dark, uncertain, and foreboding future. Fear is a matter of orientation, context, and faith. The disciples leave everything for Jesus. Now they are afraid of being abandoned to their own mortality. 
The obvious question for today, what are we afraid of? Why are we afraid? In our text, Jesus promises a blessed, certain future with him. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Jesus knows what he's talking about when he says, let not your hearts be troubled, and he has proven it. In the face of a fierce storm on the sea, he remains calm while the disciples panic. He speaks to the wind and the waves. Peace, be still. When told Herod is out to kill him, he doesn't flinch. He sends messengers, go and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. His friend Lazarus is dead for four days. His sisters have given up. They are going to wait for the end time resurrection. The disciples are holding their nose because of the stink of death. The mourners are all wailing. Death overwhelms everyone except Jesus. He commands, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus lives. And finally, he hangs on the cross, bearing the weight of our sins and the sarcastic decision, uh, derision of onlookers. In his final moments, he looks up to God, saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, Jesus has more than hinted about leaving the disciples, and so today he's emphatic. I go now to prepare a place for you. Well, that bombshell gets the attention of the disciples, and the disciples get our attention as a picture of us. I'm going to call them every man. In chapter 13, Jesus tells Peter, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. Peter is every man in every way, a sinner of egotistical bravado, rarely at loss for words. Peter is the every man who thinks he's strong enough to withstand fear until it knocks on his door. Luke 22, Peter substitutes recklessness for humble faith saying, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and death. His self-confidence quickly stumbles. His faith deteriorates to caution that remains at a distance and then panic when confronted with his true identity. A repentant Peter will follow Jesus later in ministry under the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit. And his reckless confession as Simon will come true. He will be in prison and die as a martyr. Thomas is every man with an attitude. He's the unconvinced skeptic. And at least Thomas is honest enough to say he doesn't have a clue as to what in the world Jesus is talking about. The great confessor of the Gospel of John pipes up, we don't know where you're going, and we certainly don't know the way. Jesus responds, I am the way and the truth and the life. Philip, maybe that's the one we'd like to be like. He's a receptive, helpful, and eager every man. Yet even good folk like Philip lose their patience. He's watched Jesus turn water into wine, heal the sick, cleanse lepers, and even bring the dead back to life. Surely these miracles are signs of greater things to come. And just as the disciples are prepared to put this traveling show into high gear, Jesus is leaving. Philip speaks up. Lord, show us the Father, it's enough for us. Again, Jesus, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? 
Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. The message of our gospel today is this. The future is never in our hands. It's in the nail-pierced hands of Jesus. Anxiety does no good. In fact, worry and a troubled heart will shorten your life. Matthew 6, 34, Jesus says, Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. Luther said that this one verse is interpretation and content of the whole book of Ecclesiastes. After repeated desperation, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, concludes there is only wisdom, hope, and life in one greater than him, and here's the title he uses, The One Shepherd. We need to listen to Jesus and not worry. Anxiety about us is his affair. And left to him, it's called peace. Jesus settled all the questions about our future on the cross as our substitute and as our redeemer in these three words, it is finished. Hence, the coronavirus is but another reminder of our sinful nature. It's a call to repentance. So how do we respond to the comforting admonition of Jesus? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. Well, from Solomon, fear God and keep his commandments. From the Exodus, recognize that the bread and the grace from heaven are new every day. From Sunday school, pray thy kingdom come. Live a life of faith that trusts the promises of God. Our gospel asks, can words remove the anxiety and the fear of troubled hearts? And our gospel answers, yes. The words of Jesus remove the fear and the anxiety of troubled hearts because they are the words of eternal life. His nail-pierced hands hold us secure. John 10, 28, No one can snatch you from my hand, not even the coronavirus. So the Holy Spirit admonishes us here in John 14, Let not your hearts be troubled. And the Holy Spirit explains in Romans 8, 28, For all things work for good for those called according to his purpose. Amen. This time we make the good confession in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven. And sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As newborn infants who long for the pure spiritual milk, 
So let us come before the Lord, seeking his mercy with confidence that his grace will be sufficient for our needs. We pray, Almighty Father, everlasting God, your Son has revealed you to us as a merciful Lord. Give to us your Holy Spirit that we may believe in him whom you have sent and do the greater works he has told us we will do in his name. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you have promised to build up your church to be a holy priesthood, that your people might suffer the spiritual sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving, might offer, excuse me, the spiritual sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving acceptable to you. Bless your church and bring all congregations back together again. Bless all pastors who proclaim Christ to us. Bless all church workers and those preparing for full-time church vocations, that your church may be supplied with faithful leaders and servants of your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, your power brought all things into being, and still you preserve what you have made. Bless our president, the Congress of these United States, our governor, and all elected and appointed civil servants, so that they may honor you and your purpose, establishing order and justice, encouraging virtue, and protecting all life. Give wisdom and moderation to them in their leadership for the well-being of the nation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O merciful Father, you have compassion upon the sick and those in need, and have promised not to ignore them in their afflictions. Turn back the pandemic across the globe and give us relief. Bless the sick with healing, those who suffer with strength and patience, and the dying with peace. Hear us on behalf of those who have requested our prayers. Jeff Wagner, Patricia McKinney, Doris Simmons, Chuck Wilson, Don Schisler, and Patsy Morgan. And of course, for those who sorrow at this time, the family and friends of Archie Shanebeck, father of Ann Stein, and for those in our nursing homes and those that are shut in, Shirley Biondi, Jill S. Jill S. Eskensey, Connie Hine, Dick McBee, Bob Springer, Dolores Steinhilber, Reverend Steve Up to Grave, and Dan Walls. We ask you that, Lord, be with all of those now, those who are mourning, those who are sick, and those who are shut in. Lord, in your mercy, gracious God, you have established the home and blessed those who show us your love. Bless all mothers and children in their care. Bless all families and make their homes places of blessing and love. Where your word is spoken, forgiveness reigns and love is displayed. Give us good examples to inspire youth to all that is good and pure and to seek after these things. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, you have given us wisdom of faith that through the Spirit we might know your Son to be the way, the truth, and the life. Bless all those who teach and all who learn that the goal of our knowledge may be to know Christ and to make him known. Do not let your word be bound, but let it have free course among us. Preserve those in the isolation or that are in isolation from idleness, and instead let their minds be renewed by scripture and prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate Father, you are not aloof from the needs of this body and life, and you have called us to love our neighbor in need and to give aid to the poor and to give courage and faith that we may not fear, sharing the resources you have supplied with those who live in want, especially the widow, the orphan, and the unemployed. Let love be perfected among us to drive out selfish fears. Lord, in your mercy. In your prayer. Eternal Father of an eternal mercy, you have raised up witnesses in every age and blessed us with those who endured suffering and even death in faithfulness to Christ. We give you thanks for those faithful saints and martyrs, and we pray 
you to make us strong when the face of the, when we face the last the day of the test that at length we may be brought with them into your joy the joy of your presence and the glory of everlasting life lord in your mercy we praise you O god for your goodness in hearing the prayers of your people and granting us confidence to approach your throne of mercy hear us now in the name of and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom, with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, both now and forevermore. Amen. This time we remind you of our offering and friendship folders. Uh, we hope that information is easy for you to use. Uh, it's our means of serving you better. Um, may God bless you in your tithes and offering, and, and please remember us in your times and tithes and offerings. It's important at this special time in our ministry. The Offertory of the Church. Pray the prayer our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Receive now the benediction of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Again, friends, we hope this worship time with you and with us has been a blessing. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thank you, God. Holy Lord. Yeah.
Need to buy. 